शाहीन आज चले कैसे सर आशीन ही तो भी आज सर थर्टी फिल्ड the complex pci rota i was ottf report so, so he is the best person to talk today's topic that is uh, precision pci how imaging and physiology helps to manage complex pci pattern so i welcome dr ojit manon is he here uh, also here faculty around faculties dr ulm maski from nepal dr sams manira here is the evrk hospital professor khalid mohsin from uh, universal cardiac center Dr. Kaiser Masoodullah Khan, we are from the United Hospital. Dr. Ab Abdullah Jamil from the Asghari Hospital. And the last of panelists here. I think uh, our also some of the panelists will join later on. Uh, I am requesting our chairman, Professor Dr. Abdullah Jamil, sir, please give his opening remarks and opening the session. Good evening, everybody, and Assalamu Alaikum. Today, we are going to learn something about. Precision PCI. PCI started. It has a long journey. Now we are talking about very fine PCI, and in that realm, the precision PCI imaging is the key to achieve that goal. And today we are going to hear something about it. Many of us do not have access to IVAS or OCT, but we are going to have those in future those who are fortunate enough to have both they are lucky enough some of us have only one facility or the other but if you learn it you can create a demand for it and only then we can gain more experience and be more versatile in doing the pci and ultimately all these things make better treatment of the patients possible long term better treatment we can achieve that by using these tools dr ajit menon thank you for joining us today we hope we'll be learning a lot from you thank you everybody uh the prof ajit menon sir please uh, share your screen and opening a lecture uh, our another uh, is presentation will be done by dr cm shain kobid is the our One of the promising cardiologists working in the Ibrahim Cardiac Center, Dr. Shahin. Welcome you to the session. Thank you, sir. You started your session, sir. First of all, a uh, big thank you to uh, Assalamu Alaikum and a big thank you to Dr. Mohsin Ahmed, Dr. Abdul, and the entire team over there for giving me this privilege. of uh, coming in front of you it's indeed a privilege to be in front of such an august audience and and i i am i'm honored um a big uh, hello to everyone there in bangladesh from us in mumbai india and i will my talk is today on precision pci how imaging and physiology helps to manage complex pci better now um, all of us know that can you can you see my screen yes, yes sir yeah. yes so all of us all of us are aware that uh, when when we when we do an angioplasty we are looking at something which gives a patient a result which is optimal and if as good as a, a, a bypass surgery if not better because uh, unfortunately we are always compared uh, as a, as as a younger brother of, of of bypass surgery and the general perception is that angioplasty doesn't last but we do with what we have realized over the past few years is that when we use imaging techniques and physiology to treat lesions 
Very often you convert triple vessel diseases into single vessel disease because the other lesions are not physiologically uh, 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 significant. And you also see that imaging makes it better in terms of, the, uh, of, of how to optimize the uh, angioplasty, how to plan the angioplasty, and how to get the best out of the, uh, the best result of angioplasties. Having said that, uh, I will come to the first point of my talk, and that's a, that's a fractional flow reserve, and that's the physiology of, of uh, the, the, um, uh, the rational behind the physiology of treating, treating these lesions. Well, we know that fractional flow reserve is a lesion-specific physiological index which measures the, uh, the, uh, the uh, measures the hemodynamic severity of intracoronary lesions, and um, FFR can accurately identify lesions responsible for ischemia, uh, which uh, in many cases would have been undetected or not correctly assessed by an angiography. Sometimes you over overestimate the lesions, sometimes you underestimate the lesions. And a fractional flow reserve is measured at maximum hyperemia. So the physiology of, a, uh, uh, of an FFR is the maximum achievable blood flow in a stenotic coronary artery divided by the maximum blood flow in the same artery without a stenosis. So that's PD by PA, which is measured at maximum hyperemia. And hyperemia is, is, is caused by injecting certain drugs, especially like adenosine. Uh, at specific dosages. I mean, if you're giving it intravenous, you give it at 140 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Or if you're giving it intracoronary, you can start off with 60 micrograms of, uh, of, of adenosine and go up to 200 micrograms of adenosine, especially for the LAD. So the, uh, by, by, by doing this, we are actually trying to make out the pressure difference between this part of the vessel and this part of the vessel at maximum hyperemia and thereby determine whether this lesion is physiologically significant enough to treat or not. So, uh, like I said, FFR is basically PD by PA. Having, uh, um, ha having, having said that, the FFR classification was upgraded to, was upgraded to cl class 1A in the ESC uh, and the ESCTS guidelines. And the, the recommendation today is um, that, that it, should be, it should be used as far as possible in assessing the significance of lesions before we decide to treat the lesions. And these, and, and, and these, are, these are based on certain landmark trials like the FAME and the LICA studies. And um, the, the, the guidelines still um, and, um, to today um, may, may make it imperative that unless you have a, a lesion which is physiologically significant, do not treat these lesions. Having said that, what are the learnings from the from various studies in intracoronary physiology? One was the first study was the Courage study, which, which was basically said that uh, angioplasty with uh, optimal medical treatment was not superior to optimal medical treatment alone in these patients, in, in patients with chronic stable angina. And there was the, was the, 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 the found that there was a need for a stronger means to identify for the, the identify ischemia. The DIFFA trial was one of the earlier trials which showed that stenting a non-ischemic lesion does not benefit a patient with stable coronary disease. And it is safe to defer PCI for non-ischemic stenosis identified by FFR. The FAME trial is one of the most famous trials in, 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 the, in, uh, uh, in, in the history of uh, FFR. And it has basic advantages. Uh, FFR showed that FFR has advantages in assessing multivessel disease. And you need to stent ischemic lesions and you can always leave non-ischemic lesions for optimal medical therapy. It also stated that angio, angio may over or underestimate a lesion. And physicians eyeballing 50 to 70% lesions, 65% of them were not, were not even significant. So that's, that's an important, extremely important message from this. The FAME2 trial was showed that FFR guided PCI is superior to optimal medical therapy in stable patients. And functionally non significant lesions, optimal medical therapy was excellent and in, in terms of outcomes. What is the current evidence that we have today? In terms of the, uh, the FAME five-year follow-up, of the of, of, of five-year follow-up, it showed that significant lower maze rates in FFR guided PCI compared to angio alone PCI. And FFR guidance of multi-vessel PCI should be a routine practice. The primary and when, when they compared uh, the, the IFR to the FFR, the IFR is an institute, which I will, I'll be talking about that in the next few slides. It's an instant, instant, instantaneous flow, uh, flow ratio, which is equivalent to FFR. And in terms of the RFR and the IFR, these are two different modalities of instantaneous pressure ratios. One is a Phillips uh, domain. One is a uh, Senjut domain, uh, Abbott Senjut domain. 
So the, they, they showed that the RFR was equivalent in terms of the of, of the IFR and with with a very uh, with the with a very linear curve in this. What about fractional flow reserve guide, guided multivessel angioplasty? Complete revascularization. The, 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 the dynamic three primary study was show, 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 was a study which showed that FFR guided the complete revascularization compared FFR guided complete revascularization versus infarcted arteries only in ACS patients which showed the FFR guided complete revascularization did benefit these patients. Now, FFR is measured with, like I said, using hyperemia. And hyperemia in, in, involves the injection of adenosine. And adenosine is a drug which has its own side effects and causes a lot of discomfort to the patient. But of course, FFR is the gold standard. Having said that, there are certain non-hyperemic pressure ratios. What are non-hyperemic pressure ratios? Which are, these are instantaneous pressure ratios which avoid the hyperemic agents. It saves time and it saves cost. Therefore, the IFR is an instantaneous wave-free ratio, which is a Philips uh, patented uh, product. The um, algorithm is that IFR is a pressure ratio of the cardiac cycle's diastolic wave-free interval by averaging individual beats over five beats of data collection. So they say they, they, they calculate that there is a wave-free interval here in diastole which is where the IFR is calculated. The, they say the maximum, the maximum PD by PA, or the difference in the PD by PA occurs during this wave free interval. And that is, that is where the calculation is done. So it, it happens during the mid to the end diastole at rest. Now, the clinic, what is the clinical evidence as far as IFR is concerned? The clinical evidence here is the defined flare study, which show which where the randomized patients in a one is to one randomization to FFR guided revascularization and an IFR guided revascularization as far as with, 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 with the um, with, uh, a range of 80% 80 where IFR and FFR were in agreement, 20% range where FFR or the IFR disagreed with, with, with each other. The primary endpoint showed that the IFR was equivalent to FFR in terms of the long-term uh, long -term results and in terms of major clinical events at the end of two years. So there was no significant difference between the IFR range and the FFR values in, in, these, in, in these two uh, cases. But what are the limitations of IFR? Well, IFR requires a sensitive landmarking of the pressure waveform, and it requires ECG gating, always requires ECG gating, still, and, and that's still commonly used. Assumes that maximal flow and maximal resistance occurs during a fixed part of diastole. So it calculates that this, this part of the diastole has the maximum, maximum flow and the minimal resistance. And that is a backbone of measuring the IFR. The question has always been asked that should we look only in diastole? Because does the maximum flow occur only in diastole? There are certain situations where the maximum flow can occur in early systole also, in, sorry, in late systole or in early diastole also. And that usually happens in the right coronary. So the, there's another resting cycle. There, there is another uh, non-hyperemic ratio, which is the resting full cycle, uh, full cycle flow ratio, which calculates the lowest ratio during the entire cardiac cycle. So this is basic. This has an advantage of being an, an, an unbiased identification of the lowest PDA, PDPA, and it's independent of the ECG. And it is sensitive to small pressure changes during pullback, and it a, has a high dynamic range. So this, it calculates the PDPA, the PD by PA, during the entire cardiac during the, during the entire cardiac cycle, so um, the algorithm and uh, and the, uh, deriv the, the derivation is based upon the fact that there are phasic pressures on in, in the in the flow, and the PDPA is calculated point by point, adding an anti noise filter, and then you calculate the minimum value which cal which is which gives you the RFR during different parts of the cycles. It may not be exactly in the same part of the cycle at, at, with, with with every beat. So this is the overall algorithm, and a, there are various various studies which show that there's a clinical validation of the RFR, and um, the um, sorry, um, there's clinical val val validation of the RFR. The, there's this the Illumin one plus predict. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trial of there's a uh, value prediction of that, and also uh, the validated RFR, revalid RFR, Iris FFR. Various trials have shown that RFR has an equivalence in terms of the IFR also. The validate RFR study was a retrospective study from historical data of the verified two and the IRIS FFR studies. Um, those which are measured by the IFR with the, the IFR led to the other, they were studied with the RFR waveforms. 
And the primary endpoint was diagnostic accuracy of RFR versus FFR, um, whereas where versus IFR. It showed that there was a significant uh, uh, value addition in both these, and the curves were almost linear, with almost a 97 to 98% sensitivity, accuracy, and specificity in RFR versus IFR. Now, as far as, far as distribution across the cardiac cycle in the gray zone, valid, valid RFR showed that um, the, the RCA is one, is, is one vessel where you may end up with a uh, with, with the maximum flow in late systole or early diastole, and the IFR may miss these patients. So there may be a small uh, discrepancy in the uh, in, in, in patients with critical uh, left left coronary uh, right coronary lesions in terms of the RFR and the FFR. What about the various other um, uh, real world the, the, the calculations and in terms of real world evidence? It showed that there, there has been the the uh, president in the CRT nineteen that the diagnostic error performance of RFR versus IFR the single cutoff of 0.89. There was a, a, an excellent diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and uh, uh, and, and and other, other uh, uh, analytics in terms of um, the, 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 the com comparing RFR and IFR. <clears throat> Having said that, um, there are various resting indices which are there throughout the cardiac cycle. You have the PDPA, you have the RFR, you have the DPR, and the DFR. The various resting indices which happen during diastole, and in terms of uh, deferred lesion failure, cardiac death, MI, or the re relative risk reduction, um, there was significant uh, coherence in, in, in most of these uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in indices, and there was little to choose between any of these indices in terms of clinical outcomes. The Illumin one. And uh, predict analysis showed that RFR is 94% accurate as compared to FFR using an RFR gray zone of 0.86 to 0.93, which meant that if you have an if, if you have a RFR which is more than 0.93, and you have an RFR which is less than 0.86, the diagnostic accuracy is significant. In a gray zone of 0.86 to 0.93, you tend to use the FFR to validate the RFR. So. That, that, is, that is a value that is, 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 is a value which uh, you can use in clinical practice. And if you have an RFR which is beyond 0.93, you can easily defer the, uh, the, the patient. If you have an RFR of less than 0.86, you treat it. And between these two values, use the FFR to validate your results. Now, I'm going to show you a few uh, examples of how these have helped us in clinical practice uh, in terms of um, uh, assessing the, the, the physiology of these lesions. This was a gentleman who had a positive stress test and came with a significant angina. And this is the angiogram, uh, which, which shows that there is some distal left main disease. And if you, if you look at the uh, epicranial views, um, there is disease in the diagonal, and there is, a, there is some disease after the bifurcation of the, of, of the LAD. Now, this was done in 2018. And uh, we are almost two years uh, in, into, in, 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 into his angiography. Now, he, he had an RCA lesion, which was, which was critical. Now, the question was whether this patient needed a three-vessel a two-vessel revascularization along with the diagonal uh, revascularization, or does he need only an RC at the moment to tide him over the crisis? Now, if it, I mean, we, we, as, as in Bangladesh, probably, we also have financial issues in, with, with most of our patients. So rather than sending them for a, uh, for a stage procedure at times, uh, a, a bypass procedure definitely is cheaper in most of the cases than a stage angioplasty, uh, stage multivessel angioplasty. So we do have to offer that to the patient. So here, we offered them to do, we offered that we will do a RFR to the uh, left, left circulation. And if it is found significant, then of course, we have an option of a bypass surgery also in these patients. Now, you'll be surprised that the lesion looks, uh, looks significant angiographically. The RFR is 0.92. The FFR in this vessel was 0.86. The RFR in the LAD was 0.96. So we did not do an FFR in the, uh, in, in, in the LAD. So we have both the diagonal and the LAD lesions, though anat anatomically or visually significant, they looked to be angiographically or, or physiologically non-significant. Of course, the proximal LED had a RFR of 0.97. So we just ended up treating the RCA. And this patient 
actually had a stress test in the in, in October 2020, which is which is statistically normal, and he's he's doing clinically well. So that validates our uh, judgment in terms of treating these lesions. Now, um, this is another gentleman who came with a uh, lateral high lateral wall MI. Uh, I mean, he's, he was he flew in from uh, from outside India. Uh, he had a critical uh, an angiography showed he had done the angiography there. He had found an, a lesion in the uh, uh, in, in the uh, probably lesion in the LED, probably lesion in the circumflex, had a lesion in the PDA. The PDA had an 80 to 90% osteal lesion, which uh, which which would require treatment definitely. The uh, L, the um, left circulation showed that he had a lesion in the uh, ramus, which probably was or a high OM, which is probably the reason for his infarct, and then and, and a bifurcated bifurcating lesion at that. The LED showed a lesion here, which probably also looked clinical, angiographically significant. So we decided to do a, 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 a FFR and RFR for the uh, LED lesion. And surprisingly, the, um, uh, the R -R RFR for the LED lesion came at 0.87, which, uh, which, which was in the borderline zone. So we used uh, uh, the, the uh, FFR in, in this patient and the FFR uh, with, with maximal hyperemia on three readings came at, you can see the readings here, uh, they all came uh, within the range of 0.82 to 0.87. So we decided not, not to treat this LED, treated only the LED di the um, uh, OM into the posterior and the posterior circumflex as a, um, uh, as, as, as a T stenting. And we uh, this is actually a mini crush technique and we had a good result in this. Of course, we treated the right coronary also and the patient did well. This is another gentleman, young guy, 46 year old male with uh, uh, chest pain, which is exertional, but he, uh, I mean, he was chronically stable. And this is the angiogram that we did, which showed a hazy looking lesion, tubular lesion in the, uh, in, in the proximal LED and visually looking significant, especially if you look at the, uh, the uh, iliocranial and the lateral views, uh, the, the lateral view looked at the LED looked quite, quite, quite significant at this and I'm sure uh, with, with visually tempting in terms of having to treat the lesion, but we decided that we will do a uh, RFR and IFR on this patient. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, if, if, if le left without a um, uh, physiological investigation, we would probably treat this by we treat it, treat this by default. We did a um, RFR and FFR to this patient. The RFR value came at 0.89, the PDPA after nitroglycerin was 0.91, and the FFR, maximal FFR with the adenosine was 0.82. So we decided to leave this lesion alone. So this, this patient escaped without a stent. Two years, he's doing well. Uh, this is another gen gentleman, 71-year-old uh, male patient with a, uh, with a lesion in the RCA, and also lesions, an uh, 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 eccentric lesion in the uh, proximal LED. And of course, and he came in with, again, a uh, lateral wall marker infarction, uh, which was thrombolized outside. Here is a complex lesion also. The question asked what lesions to treat. So we did a, um, we did a physiological, physiological assessment of the RCA. The RFR came at 0.93. So we decided to leave this lesion alone. We did FFR with IV adenosine, which is 0.91. Uh, the LED, uh, I had a, I'm sorry, the LED had a, um, uh, FF, um, R, 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 RFR of 0.91. And so we went ahead and did a FFR on this patient also, which came at, uh, at, at 0.93. So we decided to leave this, uh, leave the LED alone. We treated only the circumflex and, uh, and, 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 we, and we got out with, with, without treating the LED and the uh, RC. And these, we, we followed these patients up with regular stress tests at three months, six months, nine months. And in patients are willing to repeat an angiogram, we, we do advise them to repeat an angiogram at the end of one year if they are phys, uh, willing to go ahead with it. So these, these are certain values. These are certain examples of how we manage <clears throat> Uh, I mean, how we do physiology, and we try to use physiology in treating our in, in treating and helping us treat uh, multi 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 vessel disease. Um, I will come to the next part of my talk, which is precision PCI. Now, the functional lesions uh, testing headset tells us which lesions to treat, and intracoronary imaging tells us how to strategize and optimize angioplasty. Now, if you look at, um, I'm going to base my talk today on more of OCT, which is uh, what, what we use on, on, on a regular basis. 
and is one of the newer technologies that are available in terms of imaging. Of course, intravascular ultrasound is, um, it has been the forerunner in terms of imaging. And we, we, now we have the 60 megahertz uh, ultra high definition uh, imaging, which is, which is excellent. And it's, it's supposed to be as good or as bad as the OCT. Now the resolution of a CT angiography versus angiography versus an I versus, versus an OCT uh, is, uh, it shows you that the OCT definitely gives you and provides you with a much more higher resolution image. Uh, in, in, in terms of the image that you can see on, on, on and, and the definition and, and the uh, data that you can get out of uh, uh, an, an investigation. Now, um, if you look at OCT imaging for coronary artery disease, in terms, we have two options. One is a pre-PCI OCT and one is a post-PCI OCT. What does a pre-PCI OCT help us in? The pre-PCI OCT helps us in strategizing the angioplasty. There is a algorithm which is called the MLD max. So M stands for morphology, L for length, D for diameter. And the, you can understand the morphology of the lesion from an OCT by, by it can tell you whether the lesion is fibrous, where you have a homogeneous servicing. You have a fibrolipid where you have a scatter, I mean a background scatter, and you can, you can see that there is a um, diminution of the image on this side. You have uh, no, no light passing through here. You have you can you can diagnose thin cap fibrous atheromas by the by look, looking at the thickness of the uh, uh, intimal layer, and of course calcium is something which is diagnosed very easily with the uh, OCT, and this is one field where OCT helps you in terms of defining the calcification much more or much better than an intravascular ultrasound. Using an OCT, you can calculate the length of the lesion. You can stent from a normal segment to a normal segment and decide what is the length of the stent. It tells you the exact length that you need to stent. You can choose your stent length based on that. And it is fairly, fairly accurate to a large degree. It also tells you the diameter. Now, in terms of the diameter, you need to know, you need to know that on a, on a, uh, on, on a uh, OCT, you can look at, you can see the intima, you can see the media, you can see the, uh, the, the external elastic lamina. And you can see the the adventitial layer on the on, on the on the outside. So if you're considering the EEL diameter, you calculate from the external elastic lamina to the external elastic lamina, and round it down and round it down to the nearest stent size by reducing it by 0.25. And if it is the if if you're considering a luminal diameter, then you round up to the nearest stent size by increasing it by 0.25 millimeters, up, up, up sizing by 0.25 millimeters. So this is the way you look at the, uh, the, the diameters. Now, uh, in terms of the morphology, you can also you can, morphology, you can characterize them into low calcific burden, moderate calcific burdens, or high calcific burdens. And of course, the treatment options available in, in each of these will also depend upon the extent of calcium and the type of plaque that is there. Lipid-rich plaques, be very careful because they can, they can embolize, they can create trouble. Calcific plaques, Again, you need to be you need to use atherectomy devices in order to improve the, um, the, the the final residual the, the final diameter of the of, of the vessel that you get. So, depending upon what you use, you have um, you have you can either go in with the direct stenting, or you can use semi-compliant balloons, the use of NC and uh, scoring balloons, and of course rotational atherectomy when you have calcium nodules or extensive superficial calcium. Now, if, if the calcium level is high, that means it's more than 180 degrees in arc. That this, this is the arc of the, uh, of, of the image. If it's more than 180 degrees, more than 0.5 millimeters in thickness, and more than five millimeters in length, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a supposed to be a significant amount of calcium, and that definitely needs a uh, plaque modification. Common practice in such situations is NC balloon, intravascular lith 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 lithotripsy, Cutting, uh, cutting balloons, scoring balloons, or using atherectomy. This is the way how they measure the maximum thickness. So you can measure the thickness of the, uh, of, of the calcium here by placing one cursor here, placing one cursor here. It tells you the extent of the calcium thickness. So the calcium thickness of more than 0.5 millimeters is something which is significant and requires uh, the, the use of either of these devices in order to get a good result. This is a calcium, this is a classic calcium nodule which is seen on, a, on, on, a, on an OCT. The length, yes, you can measure the length of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, lesion. You can measure, measure the length of the device. You can look at suitable landing zones by looking at the normal segment 
distally and the normal segment proximally, and at least see that you can look at the, you can see the EEL for at least 180 degrees. Uh, in, in, if, you, if you cannot see it for the rest, for the, for the full 360, it should be visible for at least 180 degrees for you to land a stent in that zone. So certain areas with heavy calcification, thin cap fibrous atromas, lipid rich plaques, where you get an attenuated signal beyond the uh, beyond the intima, is are not a good good areas for landing your stent. We can measure the diameter. I've, I've told you already how to measure the diameter. Two perpendicular EL measurements, and deciding upon whether you have the EL or the uh, the lumen measurements, you round it up to the next quarter size, reducing by 0.25 as far as EL to EL is concerned, and increasing it by 0.25 for the for luminal measurements. Post PCI, how does it help you? It helps you with medial dissections. It helps you with the knowing the apposition of the stent. It helps you with expansion of the stent. What about medial dissections? It tells you that there are distal or proximal stent at dissections. You need to address significant dissections. What is a significant dissection? More than 60 degree arc extending into the media. Significant in length is more than two millimeters in length. You can measure the length of the of, of, of the dissection on the uh, B mode uh, on, 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 on the B mode. The apposition, it tells you that the, the machine will tell you automatically whether this, uh, this stent is well opposed or not. And once you identify gross malapposition, you need a proper post dilatation. Expansion of the stent is automatically calculated and gives you a appropriate post dilatation size in order, in order to post dilate these stents. And we know that these, if you ignore these, if you end up with a leaving a medial dissection, you leave with a malapposed stent or you leave with an underexpanded stent. You, these are classic predictors of major clinical events. Now, how do you, I mean, how do you see clinical, the, uh, the uh, medial dissections? Medial dissections, you look at the proximal and the medial, then the distal edge of the um, this thing. This is, this is a classical dissection which is seen, and you can see that we can calculate the length of the dissection in terms of millimeters. And here we have a length of 4.3 millimeters, which is more than two. So you need to treat these, uh, the, 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 these dissections. You can see the direction of the dissection also which will give you an idea about whether these dissections can progress and in which way. So um, this is again, the, these, are just, these are examples of significant dissections on the, on the uh, on, on, uh, um, MR, uh, OCT. And in terms of apposition, there is a indicator mark, which is on the, um, which I'll show you in, this, in the subsequent images, which tells you whether the stent is well, is well opposed or not. A red indicator more, means that there is more than four, more than 400 microns of, uh, of the clear microns of um, of, of uh, stent uh, malapposition, and that needs to be treated. Whereas a white indicator will uh, will will be uh, will mean that it is it is well opposed. Uh, yellow is somewhere in between, which will tell you that this it's malapposed, but need not did not necessarily needs to be treated. But also tells you the expansion of the stent. So stent under expansion. Though not visual and were not seen angiographically, angiographically in a lot of situations, is associated with a higher subsequent risk of instant restenosis. And one of the reasons why a stent doesn't expand well is because of calcification. And of course, if you have extensive plaque burden uh, in, in these patients, you may end up with a underexpanded stent. How do you calculate the underexpansion? The machine does it for you in terms of um, the, the uh, it, it calculates the mean reference area. And then it tells you whether the expansion limit is, is, is uh, normal or not. And it also has the advantage of um, dividing it into two segments, a distal segment and a proximal segment, because we, they, it understands that the vessel is not a tubular structure. It's a tapered structure. So the diameter over here is not necessarily the same as the diameter in, in approximately, especially in long stents. And if you look at the uh, acceptability of expansion, more than 80% is acceptable, more than 90% expansion is optimal. <clears throat> so like I said, this is an automatic stent expansion calculation and it divides into two areas where it tells you the expansion depending upon the reference diameter in the proximal segment or in the distal segment. And it tells you whether the stent is well expanded or not. Um, it also tells you that the this expansion across each frame and that's a distinct advantage in, 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 these, in, in, in this machine. So the algorithm is called as MLD max and uh, it's morphology length diameter versus medial dissection, apposition and expansion. And we also know with various studies that OCT driven optimization improves outcome. And this is the CLI-OPCI trial 
uh, angio versus OCT plus angiogarin revascularization, where there was a significant improvement in the major clinical events in those patients who underwent an OCT with uh, along I mean, along with angiography in those patients undergoing interventions. Um, it, it, various studies have, have shown that when you combine an imaging, whether it is an IVUS or whether it is an OCT, you have definitely have better results in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, better long-term results in these patients, as also lesser chances of acute complications happening and acute issues coming up in, the, in, 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 in these patients. The clinical, the clinical, the Clinical relevance of an OCT is that uh, in, in, in terms of uh, looking at patients who come in with uh, late stent thrombosis or very late stent thrombosis, malopposition has been a major factor in these, in, 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 in these studies. So either it is a acquired malop malopposition or a stent which is malopposed to begin with, malopposition is extremely important and, and, and it helps you define how to treat these patients. The light lab data, which is, which is released a few months back, uh, which is a study of, um, of com comparing the use of OCT and whether OCT changed the treatment decisions uh, when, when, uh, when, when it was used in terms of uh, patients who underwent angio uh, 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 inter interventions. Well, it, it, they, the study showed that there was a pre-post-PCI OCT impact in 83% of the lesions and a post-PCI OCT impact in 31% of the patients. In terms of, these are the various, fact various uh, points which made up the 83% of lesions where pre-PCI OCT made a change, either in lesion type, lesion evaluation, or in terms of how to treat these patients, in terms of vessel preparation, in terms of the number of stents, and in terms of the stent length and the diameter. And in terms of post-PCI impacts, malopposition, underexpansion, expansion uh, there was a significant impact in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of how did that, did it, it managed to change the treatment uh, modalities versus if it was done only purely based on an angiography. So the cumulative OCT impact was almost in 88% of these patients. The iOptico was a study from India and Bangladesh, where we were one of the centers. Um, this basically was again uh, a study to see whether OCT with, uh, with ACR uh, changes uh, the angiographic based decisions. Uh, in, in, in these treatments, and it sh did show that uh, overall there was an overall change in pre procedure treatments, I mean, pre procedure definitions in 86% of the patients, and overall change post procedure 30% of the patients mirrored the, the, uh, the uh, light lab <coughs> study, and an overall uh, use, I mean, improvement in 90% of the patients using an OCT. So you can see that the internet stent length, internet stent, stent diameter changing landing zones were the major predictors which helped in the overall change pre-procedure and stent exp under expansion, stent malaposition, and uh, ed 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 edge sections and tissue prolapse were the other ones seen in a, which, which, uh, which made an impact in the post-procedure uh, uh, study and uh, OCT study. Um, so OCT plus ACR changed the angiographic based decisions in 90% of the lesions. The clinical relevance of intravascular imaging is in terms of stent under expansion, increased risk of complications which happens with the absence of intravascular imaging, longer procedures, stent malopposition, and likelihood of using more stents because you, don't, you, you do not understand the anatomy purely based <clears throat> on a angiographic image. Why is coronary calcium such a big issue? We know that uh, there, is, I mean, uh, there are various risk factors of coronary calcification. Age, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, hypertension, renal dysfunction, these are all factors which, which increase the significance of coronary calcium. And if you look at the, 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 one of the multicenter uh, prospective non-randomized studies of one events stratified by calcium severity, calcium def, significant calcium definitely worsened the outcomes in terms of MI, in terms of target vas vessel revascularization, and in terms of major clinical events at the end of um, at the, at, at the, uh, at the at the end of two years, uh, sorry, at the end of one year, in terms of um, uh, all, all these events and, and comparing them with the extent of calcium, in one of the studies of 1,200 patients with acute coronary syndrome, calcium was seen in almost 12.7 percent of the patients in while using a uh, while, while using OCT in these patients, which probably would not have been seen if you had not used an uh, an, an imaging technique. Of course, in terms of PCI and calcified lesions, the outcomes in, 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 in calcified lesions have always been worse 
especially with the uh, with, with the BMS group and the st statistical significant uh, uh, values of uh, in, in uh, which favor the, uh, the the use of I mean the, the use of these tens, uh, especially in in calcified lesions. In one, in a retrospect a retrospective analysis of a large multi of large multi ethnic patients undergoing PCI with new generation data gelatin stents, over 12,445 uh, patients show that this proved, despite the improved safety and profile, efficacy profile of, of all these devices, coronary calcium identifies patients at short and long-term risk of cardiovascular events and should be regarded as an adverse prognostic marker where intervention is concerned. So the, the diagnosis of calcium becomes extremely important and, and, the, and a pure angiography often tends to miss calcification in, uh, in, in, in a lot of patients. So how do we approach calcified coronary disease? Better diagnosis and the right technique will give rise to better outcomes. You have uh, various techniques. You have rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, which is not available in India at the moment. And of course, you have the cutting balloons, you have scoring balloons, and you be, now we also have the opium high pressure balloons, which are specific double layered balloons, which can go up to 40 to 50 atmospheres without an increase in the size of the balloon. And of course, you have the lithoplasty, which has been in India for the last six months, six to, six to 12 months. And that is something which is a newer uh, uh, thing in, in, in our army period. Laser atherectomy is something which, is, which has been approved in India. We, we probably be started, we, we were part of the trial. So we probably will be starting this in, in, the, in the next couple of months. In terms of image-based detection, detections, uh, intravascular ultrasound and intracoronary OCT are definitely much more sensitive in, in terms of detecting calcium. The only advantage of an OCT here is you can quantitatively grade the calcium. You can calculate the distribution, localization, thickness, area, and the volume, and it also detects microcalcification. The disadvantage being that you can you end up using a lot of contrast in these patients. The disadvantage of our advantage disadvantage of an intravascular ultrasound is that it cannot assess the calcium thickness using a intravascular ultrasound because all you get is an image dropout uh, beyond the calcium side because, and because the, the sound waves cannot reflect back from there. And we also know that angiography alone may miss detecting almost 60% of calcium. And in terms of the patterns of calcification in coronary disease, uh, um, in terms of comparing angiographic and IVAS detected, detected coronary calcium, IVAS definitely had a significant advantage in detecting calcium as compared to pure, uh, to, to pure angiography. And that helped with even the arc of reference calcium and the, the, the length of the reference cal of, of calcium also. Um, using, utilizing intravascular ultrasound imaging prior to the treatment of severely calcific lesions in orbital atherectomy, which is an orbit two sub-analysis, showed that using an intravascular ultrasound prior to using and, 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 and post-procedure in patients undergoing orbital atherectomy did definitely have a better benefit in terms of a post of the orbital atherectomy MLD value. Um, so I'm going to skip these slides and I'm, I'm going to show, I'm, I'm, I'll just come to this in terms of the, uh, the detection of calcium with coronary imaging. Uh, this is the comparison of an ultra of an intravascular ultrasound and OCT in the same patients. Uh, the advantage, I mean, you can see the calcification in, 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 a, in, a, in an IVAS. The OCT gets you a much more clearer picture in terms of the depth of calcium, in terms of the thickness of calcium, in terms of whether these calcium, I mean, whether they're the, the arc of calcium. And you can, and the, the arc of calcium, of course, can be done, done with the uh, with an intravascular ultrasound also. And there's a significant amount of uh, uh, com comparability. These are two images of an IVAS and a OCT in terms of the intravascular, uh, in, in, intravascular calcium. That's an acoustic shadow of, of, of calcium here. And you have reverberations, which are behind the calcium. In this, you have uh, the thickness is going to be a little uh, difficult to, cut, to compare in these patients. And that's the arc of calcium. Here, the thickness is much, easy, much, easier, to, uh, is much easier to measure, well delineated boundary of the calcium. And you have a arc of calcium, which is probably much more better seen. Um, these are various types of calciums which are which are, which are seen in the uh, in, uh, of the, in in an OCT, and this is a calcium. This is a calcific nodule, which is difficult to pick up on an intravascular ultrasound. And of course, you have the arc of calcium and the thickness of calcium seen on this. In terms of angiography, IVAS and OCT, um, these are the comparisons of, uh, of of the of calcium either on IVAS or on OCT. OCT has an advantage in, in, in certain situations or over an IVAS, though one of the imaging techniques will tell you 
the extent of calcium. Once the calcium is assessed, you need to use a certain devices to modify these lesions. And these devices are either non-compliant balloons, high pressure balloons, cutting balloons, scoring balloons, rotational atherectomy, or vital atherectomy, which is not available with us, intravascular lithotripsy, and of course, today, the use of, uh, of, of, of ELCA or laser. So what is the strategy that you're going to be, that, that you're going to be using in these patients? And uh, there, there have been studies with, uh, of, of patients uh, in, and, uh, in finding out what strategy works in, in, uh, in, in these patients. Um, balloon expansion can crack calcium expectedly for calcium up of 225 degree, degrees and a thickness of about 0.24 millimeters. This is one of the studies, which, which is a randomized study. But of course, the opium balloon trial, an opium balloon has had multiple trials with, uh, with, with highly calcific lesions. And this shows that calcific lesions yield to very high pressure inflations of almost 30 to 40 atmospheres and sometimes more than 40 atmospheres. The advantage of the opium balloon being that it does not increase its size by more than 10% at whatever, at, at, the, at the highest uh, value of the uh, rated plus pressures. So you can easily go up on those balloons. A 2.5 millimeter balloon will go up to 2.2, 2 .2, 2.5 will go to um, a maximum of 2.7, even at 30 to 40, uh, at, at the, for, 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 for 40 atmospheres. And it is a double layered balloon, which prevents it from uh, cracking or bursting very easily. There is a co optical OCT guided calcium scoring, depending upon what is the extent of calcium. So depending upon the maximum calcium angle, calcium thickness, calcium length, you have various scoring points. And if you, and it, depending upon whether you have a, a, a low score or a high score, you can see that lower the score, better is the expansion. And low, higher the score, if you do not use a proper device, your expansion parameters are significantly restrained. Um, again, like I said, the, the, the guide, guiding of treatment in terms of uh, what you use, in terms of deep calcium, of course, uh, NC, NC balloons, scoring balloons, cutting balloons, and then stent. Um, if you have superficial calcium with a score of one to three, you can use a, uh, any of the scoring balloons or the non-compliant balloons. If you have a score which is more than uh, four, then you go ahead and you have a significant calcium arc. Of course, if it's balloon crossable, you can still go ahead and treat with, uh, with intravascular lithotripsy. If it is balloon non-crossable, you need a rotational atherectomy or a orbital atherectomy in these patients. And of course, you look at the calcium fracture on OCT if you can do it, and then subs subsequently go ahead and stent these patients. If you have nodular calcium, rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy is a treatment of choice. Of course, if you have OCT or balloon and crossable lesions, again, you, you, these patients are suitable for either a rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy or the use of laser. Uh, just a few examples before I finish my talk. This is a lady with, uh, who, was, who had a previous stent to the circumflex and the LED, came back with, a, uh, with, with, with angina, and we had a significant amount of, uh, of, of restenosis and the ostium of the uh, ostium of the LED. She refused to have surgery, and she was she. Uh, we had advised her surgery the first time also. The first time where the lesions were also bad, and you can see a, a long stent in the LED, a long stent in the circumflex. Well, this is the OCT. Now, if you can look at the OCT, these these you I mean, if I were to uh, uh, these are these are the previously deployed stents that you can see on the on on the OCT. A significant amount of of neuroatherosclerosis within the uh, stented segment, uh, and of course, a lesion in the ostium of the, uh, in, in the proximal circumflex. Um, so there's a fibrocalcific intersegment ISR in the proximal to middle circumflex stented segment. And these are the images uh, on at, at different levels of the, uh, of, of the circumflex. So you can see the stents well embedded in, the, in, the, in this thing, and you can see that there's a significant amount of new atherosclerosis in, the, in, 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 these, in, in, this, in this lesion. This is the OCT of the LAD. Um, you can see that in the, in the, in the, in the distal part here, in the, in the, sorry, in the mid-segment of the layout of the stent, the luminal diameter is about 2.09 millimeters. As it comes proximally, the, the area of the, the luminal diameter and the area reduces. And you get, and this is, this is the uh, proximal LAD and into, into the left main. So there's a significant amount of calcium which is seen 
in the in, in the in, in the stent segment uh, and out beyond the stent as also a significant narrowing at the ostium of the uh, at, at the ostium region. So here we use a three to twelve mm shockwave balloon deployed at four atmospheres that would deliver four cycles of shocks. <coughs> And we had we, we we got we got the lesion open. Um, you can see now this is something which we have seen in a couple of patients after the uh, after the uh, I, uh, IV balloon, a significant amount of outpouching where the balloon has caused a significant amount of uh, dissection, which is extending almost into the adventitia of these vessels. So here it's a scary looking lesion after the use of uh, of, of of the IV balloon. And of course, post OCT, I, uh, uh, post um, uh, procedural IVL, I mean, uh, OCT, you can see the cracks which are uh, made by the. Uh, uh, sorry, we can see that we can see the cracks made by the uh, by, by the IVL and a significant. Yeah, that those are the cracks that you can see. And extending into the uh, in, in, into the uh, uh, almost into that initial area, it's it's quite scary when you look at it. But then the the stent expansibility becomes much more easier under these under, under these circumstances. So you can see those images of the of the cuts caused by the by by, by the IVL, the dissections caused by the IVL in the stented and in the non-stented segments. And this is the, uh, uh, the, the this is the outpouching that is seen, and of course uh, we did an OC into the circumflex. We did a shockwave into the circumflex also. You can see the disruption of the circumflex. Then we went in with a 3.523 Zions expedition in the uh, uh, in, in the proximal ostial uh, uh, LED extending into the left main, and uh, with a with a crossover stent into the. Um, uh, in, 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 into the into, into the circumflex. So this was the end result of the of, of, of the of the patient. Post PCI OCT again shows that the stent is well expanded. You can you can look at the uh, you can look at the expansion indicators here. It's 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 well expanded in 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 both of both, both, both these segments. <coughs> And this is the stent which is seen in the aneurysm segment. There's a little bit of uh, malapposition here. You can never malapose. You can never oppose the stent in the in, in the segment. But we, we we leave it alone because it's it's not for over a long length. It's a very short length over which it is malapposed. Again, we went in with a 4.5 into 6 mnc balloon. Went up at 4, 4 to 5 uh, at 5 to 7 atmospheres. Till we were when we we didn't want to go anything beyond that for fear of rupturing the vessel there. Um, this is another lesion, subtotally calc occluded calcific vessels, 82 years old. Uh, you can see the uh, and this, you, can, you can see the anatomical uh, an, an, an anatomy of these vessels. The the the, uh, the LED is a badly diseased vessel. Bad takeoff of the LED here uh, at, at, at this point. You can see that the LED has two two bends uh, uh, two two bends over here. And you, and it's it's a heavily calcific lesion. So the treatment strategy was to use a rotablator. Getting a wire into the LED was a challenge. Used a rotablator there. Got a got 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 a, got a good cut in the uh, in, in the in, in the vessel. Uh, we are very slow as far as rotablation is concerned. We do not use the fast pecking method. We use a slow sustained drilling in these patients, and uh, and we get we, we get a good result in, in in most of these patients. Did an intravascular ultrasound to gut to because an OCT was not possible in this. Intervascular ultrasound shows that the the, uh, the lesion in the distal LED, I mean in the in the mid LED, and the proximal LED, which is heavily is, is quite significantly calcific, a, a fibro calcific plaque, and these are the diameters in the in 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 the various spaces. So we ended up stenting the uh, proximal LED into the uh, in, 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 into the left main, and this was a decent result, a 223 mm stent in the in the, in the mid LED, a 2.5 2.258 in the diagonal. And a 2.7512 in the uh, in the proximal LED with a with a uh, using a mini clutch technique for the diagonal recrossing and re-dilating these vessels and a four into eight mm and a four into eight four into twelve mm stents in the um, in, in 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 the left main and this was the uh, <coughs> ultrasound after the uh, after the result.
So my, my last presentation, uh, this is an interesting question where you need to change your strategies in the, and the and um, uh, based upon the uh, based upon the patients think this is a hybrid uh, approach in managing complications a 70 year old lady with did recently bad vision in the led heavily calcific led long segment disease mid led disease osteoproximal led disease osteoproximal circumflex disease and a distal left wing disease so we decided to rotavirate the led and treat the led and die and circumflex as separate as separate lesions um, we if you realize the, the burr over here jumped a little bit when we started drilling and that is where we had a problem. We realized that there is slow flow in, the, in, in all the vessels. So rotoblation was not an option now, but we are now we left with heavily cancerous vessels. What do we do? We need something to be done for the, for the, for the patient. So we rewire and we wire the circumflex, rewire the LED using BMW guide wires and we change our treatment patterns. We forget about the uh, 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 rotoblator we use a NC high pressure balloon to first treat the circumflex and stabilize the circumflex ostium and the ostial LED. And then we go in with a ultra high pressure OPN NC balloon in the mid to distal LED and subsequently a 2.2 into 18 mm stent in the, in, in the middle in the middle LED, a 2.5 33 mm stent in the proximal LED. We get a, we get a decent result here in, in, the, in, the, in the vessel. Now we go ahead and use a where we, we do an OCT to look at the extent uh, to see whether the stent is well, well, well expanded or not. Now, this is the stent expansion indicator that I'm talking about. You can see that the expansion indicator shows that the expansion is quite significantly good. This red here is because there's a branch over here, and that I mean, and, and, and across the branch, the stent will appear as being malopause. This is a slightly underexpanded under uh, malopause stent, which we, we will post dilate and get a, and and, uh, and treat it. So you can see the entire stent, whether it is well opposed or not. And once we have that, uh, this is these are the cut images to look at the uh, look, at, look at the vessel proximally. Uh, there's a dissection here in the proximal uh, in, in, in the proximal LED distal left main. So we know that we have to extend the stent into the proximal or still left main. Significant calcium in these vessels. So what do we do here? Now here we use the IVL balloon. We use the ideal balloon in the LED and in the circumflex, and we use two cycles in the left main LED and one cycle in the circumflex till we get a good result. And this is the this is the result in after using a culotte technique in the um, in in, in uh, for the circumflex left main and the LED left main. Why culotte? Because we thought that the angle of the LED diagonal uh, LED circumflex here was reasonably okay for a culotte technique. After that, we did an OCT, which showed that this is this is these are the images pre IVL and this is the post IVL stenting. Again, an outpouching of the of the vessel here, which is seen in the earlier in the earlier patient also. And uh, what we also saw was that there was a um, uh, there, were, there, were, there was a um, um, little malaposition which is seen in the circumflex. I'm not got the image here, but there's a little underexpansion of the circumflex stent. We went in and dilated that again. It helps. It helped us get an excellent result in terms of the um, of, of the panel of panel result. Sorry, I think I have one more presentation. That's the that's a um, uh, osteal diagonal lesion with uh, with unstable angina. Again, uh, we decided to treat the osteal diagonal because the stress test was significantly positive. But the stent, when we try, we tried treating only the osteum when the stent escaped into the uh, LED uh, while deploying. We had to convert this into a. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, double double kiss uh, uh, double kiss technique. So we did a OCT for the uh, LED to determine uh, uh, what what's here is the, the 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 steps of the double the double crush technique, uh, double crush the, uh, the the LED sorry the the circumflex stent, uh, the the diagonal stent. Sorry, I have a problem with the presentation. Sorry about this. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, I think uh, that that I mean that that sh uh, that should uh, end my presentation. That's the that's the last presentation. Okay, if I can show, if you're okay, I'll just show you that uh, image.
So this will, yeah, so this is the, uh, <clears throat> So the, what OCT here helped me, helped me in uh, measuring the morphology, length of the diameter of the vessel, and of course the uh, and more more importantly the size of the stent in the in 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 the, in the LAD and the length of the stent in the in the, in the LAD. And this was the uh, and of course we got a good result. A post procedure OCT showed the stent is well deployed. The, the expansion indicator is here, which shows you that the entire expansion indicator is white, which means that the expansion is is is, is significant. No edge dissection. Um, stent well opposed. And of course, um, the other advantage of the um, uh, OCT is your image of the SSE is, is the is the three dimensional image where you can actually see the origin, the ostium of the diagonal, and you can see the crushed stents which are lying at the ostium of the diagonal. The stent, the ostium of the diagonal itself is bereft of any uh, links across the diagonal ostium. So these are certain advantages as far as the imaging is concerned. And it gives you an advantage that these patients will will do reasonably well in the in, in the long in the long term. So the key takeaways here are suspected calcific lesions should be assessed by OCT or IVS prior to stent implantation, and always always prepare the lesion before you uh, before you deploy a stent. And of course, OCT following lesion preparation helps you in uh, allows for the uh, you you to recognize the calcium fracture, which is an advantage. In terms of letting you know whether the stent will the stent will deploy or not, and post stent implantation to document stent expansion. Thank you very much, and I, I hope I've not bored you. And uh, it's been a long talk. Thank you very much for bearing with me, and uh, I'm open to any questions. And uh... thank you, thank thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, you elaborate discussion regarding the physician PCI with the imaging and physiology. I think without imaging, we cannot do the complex PCI, uh, good result outcome. We need the good imaging and visit. But in Bangladesh, we have lack of lacking behind regarding the OCT. We have this central diverse and only one or two central OCT. Uh, Professor Vadu, sir, your comments regarding the, uh, the topics? I think uh, we have seen beautiful examples of how OCT actually come into play in making precision uh, PCI. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajit Menon. Thank I think you. audience have a lot of lots of questions regarding this. Uh, one question uh, that I actually uh, uh, is very important. Uh, somebody was asking, uh, OCT is very good in identifying particular in lesion, but why are, he was asking why the IVAS is more important and more superior than OCT? I, I was uh, in, in in terms of osteo. I mean, the, you are talking about osteo lesions. Yeah. Now the problem with the uh, with, with with the OCT is that uh, if you're looking at osteo lesions of the left main, the catheter has to be well engaged into the left main to give you a good shoot or good contrast injection for you to clear the blood out of the circulation in order to get a good OCT image. So you cannot image the ostium of the left main with, a, with, with an OCT very well. In most of these cases, the, the ostium of the left main is an area which is still under uh, diagnosed by the OCT. If you have an ostial left main lesion, IVUS is definitely better because you can disengage the guiding catheter and get the IVUS back into the ostium to have, get a better definition of the ostial uh, left main. That is the only situation where probably OCT is definitely superior to uh, uh, an, an intravascular ultrasound. Sorry, uh, IVAS is superior to an OCT. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Khalid Mohsen, Dr. Khalid Mohsen, sir, do you hear me? Uh, Dr. Khalid Mohsen, yes. Uh, actually, it was a real master class from uh, Dr. Ajit Menon. Actually, we have a general notion that uh, this uh, OCT, IVAS, FFR are exotic devices, actually. And uh, whenever you, uh, you have shown that these are the, not a luxury, but it's a, it's a necessity if we want to do a precision PCI. Uh, so uh, it is really a very uh, uh, eye-opening lecture. So I have a question in a research depleted economy. If uh, one cath lab uh, wants to have an uh, intravascular imaging, which one you recommend, IVAS or an OCT, number one. Number two, there is a general saying that 
if you want to defer a stenting, use FFR. If you want to uh, do a stenting, do intravascular imaging. So what, what's about your comment about, about this? Uh, two things. One is that uh, when, you, when you're talking about economics and uh, this thing, I think if you have any shoes there, have been, and if you want to choose between one uh, this thing to begin with, uh, <coughs> um, I would probably go for an, uh, for, 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 for an OCT in these circumstances because uh, the definition that you get with an OCT is probably much better than an intravascular ultrasound. Of course, now with the 60 megahertz intravascular ultrasound coming, your choices are very, very uh, close by when choosing whether an OCT or an or, or this thing. But the OCT gives you a better um, a post angioplasty image also. It gives you a much more comfort level in terms of knowing that your angioplasty has been done precisely. The only disadvantage being that the, the use of uh, extra use of dye. But now there are certain studies coming in with use of saline in place of dye or diluted contrast in, in plain those patients with, 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 with renal compromise. And yes, um, this adage that if you don't want to stand, if you want to defer standing to an FFR, if you want to stand, use an IVAS, is something which has been, which is going to be a big question mark uh, in, in, because when you do an intervascular ultrasound, the lesion looks significant. You do an RFR or, or you do an FFR, the lesion doesn't look, but we have to go by these, these studies that we have that unless you, I mean, you, if you see, there are two things. One is the, the uh, value of the FFR, and the second is the, is the plaque morphology. So if you have a FFR value, which is normal, but you have a uh, high risk, very high risk plaque in a very high risk patient, probably you may have to defer to change your strategy of treatment. But otherwise, we, in terms of uh, deciding to treat or not to treat, we still go by the physiology measurements and not by the uh, intravascular ultrasound measurements. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Ormaski here. He's from uh, Nepal. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Ormaski is the consultant of in the Nepal. Or Urasi, please, any question or comment? Oh, no. Thank you for your very nice presentation. I have simple questions. Well, uh, resource limited area. How often do you use this imaging, and what would be your case scenarios where you definitely use imagings. Do you routinely use or do you have any specific indications to use because of uh, resource constraints? Dr. Maski, even, even we have resource uh, constraints uh, a lot and our imaging is about say 10%, 10 to 15% of our patients. <clears throat> and uh, that's because we do, we do end up doing a lot of complex patients, complex procedures and left main procedures uh, where we end up using imaging. Now, I would say that if you're doing a left main uh, procedure or you're doing a multivessel angioplasty or a, or, or a multivessel multi-stent uh, procedure, I think an intra, uh, some form of imaging would definitely help, would definitely help. In spending so much money, if you can use an intravascular ultrasound catheter for which, which, might, which is definitely not probably so expensive, I think it, it definitely gives value addition to the procedure and in telling you that your, your minimal luminal di a, 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 a diameters, the luminal areas are well within the uh, uh, prescribed ranges for you to give a good result to these patients. Uh, it's not that every procedure has to have a imaging. Imaging can be limited to those high risk complex left main or, or left main procedures. Uh, Dr. Kaisar Khan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all. Indeed, it is a brilliant lecture. Learned a lot from this, from your ex experience and and presentations. Uh, yes. Uh, nowadays, we have to look out for precision PCI, where we can have comparable result with cabbage, and especially you know, CT score more than twenty. A two or maybe in future more than 32 uh, when we have to compete with cabbage uh, for uh, long-term results then this precision PCI both by imaging uh, will help us a lot. About IFR, uh, IFR or DFR or RFR whatever you uh, uh, tell it it will help us to uh, know the physiology of the lesion and and select our strategy and we can reduce the number of stents because what, what we're afraid that if you use IFR, uh, then maybe we have to uh, fight with some economic constraint. But sometimes we've seen that when you use IFR, then multivessel PCA becomes, you know, with, with 
end up with less scans. So of course, with, with the advance of uh, technology, we need to bring this thing. And of course, we use it in every patient in, in, a, in a country like us, but in selective patient, it, it needs to be used and everybody should have an experience and knowledge on it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Samsmanwad, Dr. Samsmanwad, do you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Menon. Actually, thank you very much for your wonderful academic lecture, particularly about the physiology and imaging. Imaging has a lot of comments have been done. Uh, my a simple question about this physiology, the FFR, RFR, uh, IFR, DFR, all these things. Uh, in your real life, uh, do you uh, actually do FFR practically in all cases? No, we do not do FFR in, in, in all cases. It's practically not possible. Uh, because like I said, uh, only if it's a borderline lesion <clears throat> in terms of uh, what we look at anatomically, then of course these patients, we, we do tend to do an I, IFR or, 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 or an RFR or an FFR in these patients. But our usage is again limited to about 15 to 20% of our patients where we use these physiology before we, uh, and it's mostly in complex procedures. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our but uh, uh, when you when you have multivessel disease, uh, yeah. a lot of times patients are sent for bypass surgery. You know they say that okay, the multivessel disease do a bypass surgery. But a lot of these patients, when you do the, um, the, the the physiological measurements, you find that a lot of these lesions are not clinically significant. So you can avoid the uh, multiple 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 stents or uh, CABG in some in, in a select in a select group of patients. Yes, yes, I was actually very impressed with the first case you showed with the RC and LED case. Yes, sir. yeah. That would have gone. And luckily, he's two years. I tried, in October, he's uh, he's uh, he did a stress test and, and sent it across to us, which is completely normal. So it shows that it does have some value. And uh, sometimes we have an ocular stenting reflex. Oh. We we see a lesion, we do want to stent it. The question is whether these stents, these lesions require stents or not. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Doctor uh, Ojimo, just wait uh, on another case cases. Doctor Shahin Kobe, uh, presented cases. Please uh, discuss the cases. How Dr. Shahin do the cases with IVAS and OCT imaging? Dr. Shahin, please uh, present your case. Dr. Shahin is Shahin Kobe is the associate professor of cardiology and IBM Cardiac Center. Dr. Shahin, please share your screen. Thank you, IPDA, for inviting me to present some cases in front of this learned audience. My name is Sam Shahin Kobe. I'm working as associate professor and consultant in cardiology, Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital and Research Institute. My title is Cases Over Cocktails. I don't have any potential conflict of interest. My first case, 60 years old female, diabetic hypertensive transferred from another hospital as a diagnosed case of unstable angina. She was hemodynamically stable, ECG revealed thin version in P1 to P3, ejection fraction 60%, no region or motion abnormality, RTPCR was negative for COVID-19. This was our CAG of left side. There is an intermediate lesion in LED with slow flow after the Dion branch. So multiple views are taken to assess the severity of LED lesion after the diagonal branch. There is slow flow in LED also. RC was normal. So how should I treat? Uh, I need opinion from the expert panelist. So whether I put a stent in LED directly or put the patient on guideline related medical therapy or consider FFR or follow up with the stress test, which one will be ideal for this patient? Any comment, please. I, I mean, I, if I make a comment, I, I, I would, I would, in this such situation, I would, uh, I mean, it, it was, it was a un, uh, un, uh, acute coronary syndrome, right? Yeah. So you have two issues. One is the uh, the severity of the lesion, and the other is the 
type of lesion, the, the morphology of the lesion. So um, here, yes, FFR would be a uh, would, would, would be a consideration, but probably this is something where uh, because we we have a situation where um, the lesion may be a lipid rich or a or a, or a vulnerable plaque, uh, that that's something you need to take into account in uh, in, in in these circumstances. Okay, thank you. So imaging is the most important thing, Dr. Ajit Manon, here. Yes, sir. Image, imaging would be extremely important in these situations because uh, if the if the lesion is uh, if if, the, if this lesion is, uh, is, is is shows a thin cap fibrous atheroma or it shows a plaque erosion or if it shows a um, a, a lipid rich uh, plaque, I would rather treat these lesions than and than, than leave them alone because they have a potential for plaque rupture again and uh, creating trouble. Okay. So, what is the value of uh, FFR in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome? Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, in, in, in acute coronary syndrome, if you're, if you're looking at the non um, non palpitation, uh, non uh, this thing, um, uh, vessel, uh, then yes, you, you FFR has a uh, has, has has a value. But in the culprit vessel, you need to look at the entire clinical scenario before you judge whether the patient, I mean, whether an FFR itself would be ideal or whether you'd like to do an imaging. Because a lot of situations you see that the, the, the culprit vessel might have a very high risk morphology plaque in these patients. And if the area of supply is large, I would rather go with an imaging and decide to treat these lesions uh, irrespective of what the FFR shows. Okay, fine. You can yeah. So, how should how, how it was treated? I have considered if uh, it safety of intermediate lesion. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear, hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, so I have uh, to that shine I think. Uh, to assess the severity of intermediate lesion in LED. So, if FFR was crossed in LED. And the value came out as 0 0.80. On maximal hyperemia, hyper it was 0 0.8. So, however, due to some reason, the patient attended defer PCI. She left hospital along with GDMT. The patient was totally asymptomatic at three months follow up. I think, Shaheen, the, the important thing is that uh, Dr. Utipanen was saying the, what is the nature of the lesion? Is it vulnerable? Is it stable? We see patients who have very calcific lesion, uh, more than 90, 95% stenosis, and patient is almost asymptomatic and doing very well even years of medical treatment, refusing any sort of intervention. And we see patient only 40, 50% lesion. We are letting it go, they keep on medicine, patient deferring a little bit and coming back with acute MI. That's why the value of imaging uh, sometimes important. That's why FFR has limited value in acute syndrome. So I have a question. What was the adenosin? Was it uh, intravenous or intracoronary? If it's intracoronary, what was the dose? It was intravenous adenosin. Continuous mm -hmm. IV infusion? No, it is the, it is the, Dr. Shine. how the do you do dose of the adenosin? Yeah. 100 microgram, 100 microgram. <coughs> so did you, next, did you give it intracoronary or did you put the infusion in? Infusion. That is intracoronary. And that is one did you, microgram. Did you get enough bradycardia during the uh, uh, injection? Uh, 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 usually when we give irinusin in uh, IV form, that's intravenously it doesn't produce bradycardia. But if you give intracoronary, then it will produce bradycardia. So far, I know different study has proven that. But if you don't get bradycardia, you don't get hyperemia good enough, actually. Yeah, you yeah, give a good FFR. Lots of study proved that uh, if you give intracoronary admission, it may not produce bradycardia. But did you get bradycardia here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I have a question to Dr. Menon. What would be the ideal dose for a Intracoronary adenosine in this scenario is um, 100 microgram enough? In, intracoronary adenosine normally would be for the LED. The ideal dose is at least about 240 micrograms maximum. 
you can start off with uh, 100, 120 and go up to about 240 micrograms intracoronary. So I will move to the next case, please. Okay, my case two, 55 years old male patient, diabetic dyslipidemic, recent admission in another hospital with unstable angina. He was hemodynamically stable. EC ribbed well and sign. Ejection fraction normal, no regional motion abnormality. RTPCR is negative for COVID-19. This is the CAG of left side. Shaft of left man has a mild disease. Proximal LD has 90% stenosis. Smaller OM1 has diffuse disease. You can see there is severe disease in LOD. And another disease after the D2 branch, there is 70% stenosis after the diagonal 2 branch also. So, two lesions in LOD, proximal and distal LOD. And this is the RCA finding, there's 80% proximal and 70% mid part disease in RCA. In summary, this case, left main has mild disease, proximal LD has 90% stenosis, distal LD has another 70% stenosis, smaller OM1 has diffuse disease, dominant RC has 80% stenosis and pro in its proximal part and 70% stenosis in its mid part. So how should I treat? I preferred image guided PCA in this case. So guide catheter was JL 3.26 friends and guide or was on blue. Pre-relation was done by 2.5 into 10 millimeter NC balloon at 14 atmosphere. Stain was advanced into LED. Proximal LED was stented by 3.0 into 30 meter drag lifting stent at 18 atmosphere. So I have, sorry. An IVAS run was taken. This is the IVAS imaging. After stenting of the proximal LED. In the distal part, you can see there's mixed plaque with some calcification. Factor it speaks of the plaque is mixed plaque, I think. There is some sort of calcification there. And then now the stents appears to be visible. It is well opposed and there is no dissection or hematoma and proximal LED stent. So based on IVAS, a 2.5 into 33 millimeter drag lifting stent was deployed in this style LED at 16 atmosphere. So this was the result after deploying stent in distal LED. And this was the final result of LED. Now come to RC intervention. Guide catheter was GR3.56 friends at guide wire of on blue. I was trying to stack him after negotiating the wire. This is the IVAS image of RCA.
So based on IFAS, a 4.0 into 38 millimeter dragon tooth stain was deployed in RCA at 24 atmosphere. Post dilution was done by 4.5 into 15 millimeter NC balloon at 24 atmosphere. And post PCI was run or second. This paint is well opposed and there is no dissection or hematoma. And the final result of RCA, very beautiful result, is of Gene 3 Pro in RCA. So my final case, 36 years old young female, diabetic, prior stem extensive and treated in another hospital in July 2020. CH was done in November 2020, which revealed DVD and was recommended for PCI to LED and NCX. ECG revealed older my androceptal, ejection fraction 40 to 45% with mild MR. This time she was admitted for elective PCI with post-PCI, post MI angina. RT-PCR is negative for COVID-19. This was the case, the severe disease in LCX and LAD. LAD has true bifurcation lesion at beyond branch level with Medina 111 and LCX has 90% stenosis. So initially I targeted the LCX first, guide catheter was XB 3.06 frames and guide was cyan blue. I was run as taken in LCX. And based on I was a 3.5 into 33 millimeter drag stent was deployed in LCX directly at 18 atmosphere. Post dilution was done by 3.5 into 15 millimeter NC balloon at 26 atmosphere. Uh, post PCI, I was run as taken. The strength was well opposed in LCX. There was no dissection or hematoma. So now come to the strategy of LED diagonal bifurcation lesion. Whether I choose single strain strategy, two strain strategy, if so, which technique? Tap. DK crash, VSKs, or Kulot. Any comments from the panelists? Dr. Urmaski? With somebody else, so. Any comment from the Can you see the Andrew, please? Sorry. Yes, I am showing you this. Yeah. This is a true bifurcation lesion in LED at the yeah, I think the best option yeah. because the diagonal is a big one. You do a provisional stenting, and if you can use DK cross, is currently a recommended technique if you have to use a diagonal branch. I mean, a two stain strategy. And the diagonal is quite big, so you'll end up doing a two stain strategy. And whatever you choose, is you'll have to choose a method which you have quite familiar and which you feel comfortable. Preferably DK cross is, I think, the best option here. So will I proceed or any more comment? Dr. Oji, dear comment, please. I, I, I mean, um, I'm not able to see the uh, diagonal properly. The diagonal ostium is not so bad a disease. The flow in the diagonal is good. The LED, um, uh, is 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 definitely uh, uh, I mean this thing. I I, I probably um, I would I would I would I would go to the two stain strategy in this patient because the distal distal diagonal is a large vessel and um, in fact I feel the diagonal and the LED both distally are equally almost equal in size if you look at a couple of angles. 
I think uh, probably yes, I would agree that uh, either a decay crush or a um, or, or or a mini crush would be the the, the treatment of choice. Uh, looking at the distal, looking looking at the size of the diagonal. I was also thinking of doing a provisional stenting for the diagonal. If you can recross into the diagonal, then a provisional a, a, a tap uh, a, a tap technique also would be good. Okay, Shine, you can go forward. Uh, uh, I chose a two stent strategy that is DK crash. So, guide catheter was XB 3.06 pens and guide was CM blue. Initially, the wire was placed in diagonal branch, but it was difficult to add the LAD. The lesion is very critical there, you can see. So, after negotiating the wire in diagonal and LAD, epoxy free relation was done in LAD with the loan. The 2.5 into 23 meter driving stent was advanced inside branch. And a balloon in place in main vessel. Stenting upside branch was done with 2.5 into 23 millimeter driving stent at 16 atmosphere with 1 to 2 millimeter protrusion in the main vessel. The contrast induction was performed to ensure that no distal dissection was present and no additional stains are needed in the side branch. So removal of side branch wire was done and balloon and a balloon crash at main vessel was performed. First KBI was done after wording upside branch to proximal cell of cross pain. This is the first KBI image. Then main vessel stenting was done with 2.75 into 38 millimeter drag looping stent at 16 atmosphere. So image was taken after male vessel stenting, where was placed in diagonal bands followed by that. And first spot was done with NC balloon. Then rewiring the side bands to the proximal cell was done. For final KBI, two balloons were placed in diagonal and LED subsequently. And final KBI was done. This is the image of the final KBI. Then final report was done. I was run was taken. And this is the I was run following DK crash. Stent is well opposed and there is no dissection or hematoma. And the side branch is preserved. So this is the stain bush image of the DK crust stenting. You can see it's a very well visualized stain in LED and diagonal. This is the final image of LCX and LED stenting in a 36 years old female. 
with image guided PCI. In summary, the coronary angiogram frequently fails to establish the hemodynamic significance of coronary stenosis with accuracy, particularly for the intermediately narrowed lesions. FFR assists the operator in deciding to treat or not to treat coronary lesions based on ischemia. The anatomic and morphologic features of the stenosis and reference vessel segment can be assessed by IVAS. IVAS is a valuable tool for ensuring optimal stent expansion and start apposition after stenting. Physiology and image graded PCA always give you confidence when you are doing it in a complex case. Uh, this is my hospital located in Dhaka, Shahabad. And I am very much proud to be a part of this elite team of Ibrahim Kardec Hospital. And thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your attention. And before concluding, I would like to give special thanks and acknowledgement to my mentor, Professor Saidur Rahman Khan, who is watching and seeing my case presentation. I'm really glad uh, that he participated in this program. Thank you everyone for your active participation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ajimur, a few comments. Uh, if OCT is used in this case, how are you uh, more comfortable than IVAS or OCT, which is superior in the cases by the uh, Because we are usually use the IVAS. If we need the buying the OCT, what is superior to the OCT in that case is the bifurcation on the on without calcium. Um. In, in, in terms of uh, such such lesions, I think uh, yes. the, only yes. Advantage yes. Of an, uh, the only advantage of an OCT is, of course, when you have long stents and the diagnosis, uh, yes. you can you can be sure that the stent is well expanded and well uh, well well, well uh, opposed onto the uh, the thing, and you can also see the bifurcation view and make sure there are no struts uh, there and there's no there's no struts sitting across the uh, ostium of the side branch. So there have been some studies that show that when you leave some struts or links across the, the ostium of the side branch, that is one of one of the niduses for uh, pannus formation and leading to restenosis in, 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 in these patients. So that, the advantage is, that, that is the only advantage as far as uh, concerned. But that is, that is a distinct advantage. But of course, here they have used the, uh, the, the uh, Boston, uh, the, the, the Boston Ivers, which has definitely got a much more resi better resolution than the Philips Ivers. And uh, it, it, it's it's quite. I mean, it's it's reasonably it is reasonably advantageous if you do not have the OCT, the uh, IVAS, uh, the Boston IVAS is a is a, is a good enough machine. Uh, thank you, sir. Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman is here. Dr. Saidur Rahman, Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman. Yeah. You're <laughs> regarding I, the pages. I, you are yeah. uh, hearing me distinctive, distinct. My my sounds are distinct here. Or I have to take the microphone. No, no, you're okay. This one is okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, here, well, okay. In that case, so the first thing is that uh, because uh, because it is for the fellows, that's why I'm just telling that uh, the eyeball estimation and versus the the super camera ball estimation, whatever now it is the imaging, the, like whether you take the IVAS or OCT, whatever it is. So still now the old, uh, the legendary cardiologists, they have that uh, audacity to tell that our eyeball is the best one. So, so we, we don't need that much of the eyeball. That is for the super perfection. That's true. But uh, whenever, you know, it's like the driving a rickshaw and, or uh, driving a car. So it means that when you start driving a car, then you will never think of the rickshaw again. So it like when you start imaging and then at that time it is it becomes so much familiar and beautiful to you that I will estimation sometimes may not uh, work that much in your brain. So that is the thing. For me, it's uh, like what Dr. Shaheen has shown these cases. These are actually in our hospital nowadays, uh, the IBUS imaging is uh, getting very much frequent. And it is, it is getting frequent just not to what Dr. Menon has told about the ima imaging, the importance of the imaging. It's really, really important. And you can do the IVAS imaging in a tailoring approach. 
like even one IBUS catheter, like we are using the Boston one, the optic cross, and we can use it uh, for four or six times sometimes. So you can, you can minimize the cost. And especially uh, for these sort of things, so for this sort of cases like bifurcation cases, uh, I really do the IVUS is just to know because in case of bifurcation or in case of CTO lesion, when you're opening it, in these sort of cases, the distal reference diameter of the vessel, the target vessel is so much important to to put a stand of real and perfect diameter. Otherwise it will end up with uh, under expanded stand or it will end up with an edge dissection. So it's very important with an IVUS or the OCD, whatever you have in your plan. And, and that's why nowadays in my one third of the cases, even it is a mouth watering lesion, but later on it, it will end up with CV, uh, with, a, with a, you know, that uh, spotty calcification or a nodular calcification inside that you are getting you're feeling hard to do an intervention. In that case, this IVAS image will help you a lot. And, and that's why I think in this sort of specific subset of cases, especially for the vaporization, especially for the calcification, and especially for the CTO cases, and especially to understand the distal reference diameter and after stenting to see the positions. These are helping, helping a lot to me like Dr. Shahin has started also, and this, uh, he, he, he has been also enthousi enthusiastic about this sort of things. And, uh, and whenever you will start with this imaging technology, and this imaging will help you a lot, and in the long run, it will help the patient a lot. That, that's all I can tell. Exactly. Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Ojit Menon. Here, Dr. Professor Supiyaraman here. He's our uh, legendary intervention cardiologist, Bangladesh. He's our teacher, Professor Supiyaraman. Do you hear me, Madam? Thank you, Madam, being with us, Dr. Ojit Menon. Uh, Professor Supiyaraman, please a uh, few comments because we are uh, already around two hours going on. Supiyaraman. So I say okay, good, and I say bye bye. No. Uh, no, no, no. I just want to wake you up. Um, good evening. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Uh, it was excellent presentation by Dr. Menon. I uh, was um, listening and uh, he has really, for the fellows, has pointed out indication and the result of it, why you should use it, why you shouldn't um, uh, should, uh, make a habit of it. Which is true that it is a, in our uh, background, it is expensive, but gradually everything, everything is coming to our, um, uh, within our reach to do it. But there again, you know, he's doing 10% of cases, like all, or many, many centers are doing uh, around that 10% uh, uh, the IVAS or OCT. But the only thing is that, you know, the time has come as uh, Professor Saidur has said, leaving rickshaw, I usually don't compare rickshaw, I usually compare baby taxi with the car because baby taxi driver becomes the car driver. The rickshaw never comes to a car driver. That's not the uh, way. Anyway, it's, um, the thing is that once you are used to it, it's okay. But there again, there are some like main stem you're doing, bifurcation lesion you're doing, you're doing DK crash, things like that. If you have IVAS, if you have OCD, these are definitely going to do good for you also for the patient. So, you know, these are all new, new tools will come out again in future. Maybe one where will do all the thing. One day will come that you will pass the where, where will give you everything. That sort of thing will come out, who knows. But um, presentation from uh, Dr. Shain, the cases were very nice. I just wanted to know the last case, the lady, was she a smoker? Dr. Shain, your 38 years oh, she, old lady was a no, smoker? No, no, 36 years female. She only diabetic, only diabetic, madam. Only I know, diabetic. I have seen the diabetes. Because I, I had a couple of patients, 30, 29, 30, and 31 age, young ladies, uh, you can say, because i um, comparing with my age, but that they um, had uh, no diabetes, no stress was there, very much family stress was there. Uh, non-diabetic, uh, no dyslipidemia, but uh, 
they were heavy smoker. At the end, when I found a critical 99% lesion in LAD, two of them and one of them was in LCX. When I inquired and I, I couldn't convince myself she, uh, being on this, uh, 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 what you call in this cardiology for a long time, then I, I ultimately found out that the, all of them were heavy smokers. So I think you should inquire about those as well to make an effort uh, if you find some young ones, ladies mainly. And, and diabetic patients are different species, they are different. So uh, thank you again. Uh, it was a really nice, um, uh, I, I didn't have the opportunity to use any of them, but uh, it looks like that is going to make the life much, much, much easier than what it was before. And the result will be better. Restronesis hopefully will be less as well. So I wish all of you uh, good health. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adi Philemon, Dr. Adi Philemon, lot of discussion yes, here. Yes, sir. Any, yes, sir. Any, any question in the chat box or for the uh, faculty, uh, for the uh, panelists? Um, uh, at, first, at first, I'd like to thank uh, Manon, sir, for his brilliant lecture. As I, I have been a, a fan of uh, Dr. Manon. I also like to thank uh, my friend uh, for presenting the case, Shahin Kovit. He's doing very good. Uh, so I also like to thank IPDA for arranging the sequential sessions for a long time, last six to seven months. And, and it is being uh, upgrading, uh, every session is upgrading day by day. So uh, one of the things is that, uh, what I feel the uh, intervention is like a uh, generation, the first generation intervention, second generation intervention is now the fourth generation intervention is going on. Uh, it, it is a complete package. It comprises of uh, different imaging and uh, tools and and day by day it will be developed and at and at present moment we are getting the oct and 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 um, but uh, we are using it very less due to lack of availability of the machine oct machine in different centers in our country but to identify the vulnerable plaques oct is very good what i, I feel and the, uh, the for the calcium is ivas is good but they are not uh, comparable to each other rather they are uh, uh, helping each other so uh, uh, doing intervention or for the precise intervention, I think, uh, so the tools, the optimum use of tools is very essential and identify which tools uh, to use when. And it should be tried to the different centers to make these tools available for the precise intervention and for good long-term and outcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, good. Last comment for Dr. Abdul Al Jamil. Uh, Dr. Jamil, sir, he's a senior consultant of Asgali Hospital. Dr. Abdul Al Jamil, do you hear me, sir? Yes, I do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I thank the uh, IPD authorities for uh, making me a panelist today, and I learned a lot of things about imaging and um, physiology of coronaries, and and we have the opportunity to do uh, IFR and FFR as well as IVAS. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ajit Menon, for uh, nice deliberation. And also, uh, Dr. Shahin, for presenting such nice cases. And in my opinion, for uh, spacious vessels like left main or ectatic coronaries, IVAS gives much more information than OCT. <coughs> and uh, for the rest uh, OCT is better. OCT gives a few millimeter or uh, say intimal uh, texture much more better than uh, media adventitia. But IVAS covers uh, up to the adventitia. Uh, uh, that's my opinion. Um, and uh, for the beginning, and where, uh, what uh, Dr. Khaled Mohsen said, uh, if you have IVAS, you can perform most of the imaging, but uh, with OCT, those special vessels and let men, maybe a bit difficult to visualize every details. Um, and uh, IFR is uh, sometimes preferred than FFR in case of multi-vessel disease, that's because uh, the, uh, it de uh, FFR depends on the distal runoff of the coronary artery but IFR, uh, you, uh, it, it takes the physiology of individual coronary arteries, not depending on the other multivessel, if there is multivessel. 
Uh, that's uh, I end here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mohsin. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Sadiro. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I want to uh, just ask ask a question to Dr. Ajit Menon. Yeah, Dr. Ajit, you are here. Good, good evening, sir. Yeah, uh, just um, one thing is that uh, how much uh, you, uh, you, 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 whether you have uh, talked to the IVAS or the OCT catheter, because I'm just discloding one fact that in, even in South Asia, the first time the light lab uh, OCT has come to our center back 10, 15 years, 10 years back. It was the time domain OCT at that time, not the frequency domain OCT. So that's why we, we are not using it anymore at that time. But the thing is that in case of what I am feeling if with the IVAS catheter, uh, also that in some very tortuous uh, coronaries or in a very calcified LCX with a 90 degree angles, or in some uh, some areas where I was catheter, even after ballooning or whatever you are doing, even I was catheter is not crossing, or the camera is going beyond the tip of the of the I was catheter, and is also when we have used the light lab OCT at at that time, it is so so thin and fragile sometimes that it may not cross and we may not. So how much you you feel that one because uh, or or what sort of inability to take the catheter in the desired position. Uh, is it happening sometimes to you or not? It, it, uh, you are absolutely right, sir. Especially in uh, catheric vessels, vessels with tortuosity, uh, the, the circumflex, uh, etc. You do need, I mean, you, it, it is difficult to track the uh, OCD balloon in a lot of times without any predilatation. So these are certain, mm -hmm. uh, unless you predilate the lesions or you rotabrate the lesions, get a good, uh, get a good lumen. And then in these circumstances, you are, I mean, you still need a lot of uh, uh, technique to pass these catheters because the catheter is a, is a very flimsy catheter. Yep. It's not, it's not a very pushable catheter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you add, there, there, there are two components to it, the wire the wire component and the imaging component. So you have to make sure they, they, they do not diverge from each other. If they diverge, diverge from each other, you, can, you, can, you may damage the, uh, the, the, the camera part of it. So there are certain things that you need to be careful when you're tracking the... Uh, um, the, 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 cat, the catheter down. So in terms of trackability, yes, the Boston, so Boston IVAS is definitely more trackable than the uh, OCT catheter. And the Philips IVAS is not, is not I mean, it will not track where any of these will, uh, they, they, they will not track because they, uh, that's much more bulky. So yes, you, I mean, you do find a lot of situations where you will find it difficult to track the OCT, but with experience, you will learn, you, you, you manage to learn how to track difficult. No, no, I, I'm just asking you very specifically that is there any other uh, added uh, uh, out of the book maneuver you have to, you, you have developed yeah. some sometimes to put a catheter in such a way because sometimes I, I feel like, like you know, that the camera is going in a different direction and the catheter so, is going sir, in a different direction, and uh, no other means, like other than sometimes you may take a guide liner or a guidezilla and going deep to the there and to take the catheter because you know that guidezilla or the guide liner itself is traumatic sometimes. So just to put a catheter there, I will take a guide a guideline or guidezilla. That's also sometimes you know that we don't want to. Yes, sir. So what, what you can do in these circumstances is in some situations, you can you, you try and push the guide wire and the, and the catheter together. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that the two, that the two images that you see, the wire and the imaging part of it, do not, do not diverge from each other. They have to go hand mm -hmm. in hand. Mm -hmm. The other way is to give a gentle traction on the guide wire with, with one hand and slowly advance the catheter with the other so that they go, they, they are always in parallel. Yeah. The moment it starts diverging, you are in trouble. So make sure that the two, the, the two parts of the catheter are, are in are parallel. You have gentle traction on the guide wire, gently advance it. And there has to be a little traction on the wire. The second possibility is push both of them together. Try pushing both the catheter and the wire to but if, but if it is, you know, if it is in the middle or in the proximal part of the main vessel, it is. But when it is stuck in the in, in the left main because yes. of the tortuosity, then 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 you have nothing to do there actually. What else you can do there? 
no you can't you can't do much except try these maneuvers if it doesn't cross then mm-hmm. you have to possibly uh, like you said use a guide zilla yeah. or a maneuver yeah. yeah okay don't fracture, don't fracture the catheter inside yeah yeah that's a, that's a, that, that's the thing that uh, sometimes now i'm feeling because lots of calcified cases are coming in our diabetic center so yes. you know that sometimes it becomes very much because with great hope we are going there but sometimes we can't do that precise our precision pci not all the time even we have the modalities yes sir i fully agree with you thank, thank you. you thank you sir Thank you, Dr. Ajit Manon, being with us for uh, more than two hours. I think definitely you will better and reach our IPD archive. We have a YouTube channel, so we uh, your lecture definitely enlightened our archive. Our fellows, when uh, they are at the time, go through your lecture, repeat it again and again, and knowing the physiology and imaging. I thank uh, Abbott Vascular to sponsor this program. also Bixing Pro Pharma, doing lots of job last eight months in the corona situation and our renowned faculty is here. I also thank Dr. Shine Kobit. Uh, next Thursday, uh, there is off, no class on the next Thursday, no, because on 15th January, it is happy to announce that IPTI integrates his own research center at Pantopath uh, in the middle of the Dhaka city. I think we are all everybody requesting to join that program. Our renowned national professor, Dr. Malik sir, inaugurated this program. I invite everybody to join with us. I am requesting Professor Abdul Aziz Chudi please uh, closing the session. Professor Wadud sir. Thank professor you, Professor Abdul Aziz, yes. for patiently listening to this enlightening lecture. Uh, Dr. Aziz Menon, we are really lucky. to have this beautiful lecture from you and you know as i was saying m- many of us don't have the uh, access to oct but we should aim high and we should hope that in future we will be getting access to that and getting a thorough understanding of what to expect from a modality of uh, in- intervention actually helps you to better use that Uh, make it more economical and get the best out of the whole thing and one thing i would always ask the fellows please please you have the all the tools you have the new discoveries new instruments everything coming but never ever forget the human quotient never forget the patient perspective never forget the patient presentation the comorbidities the long term outcome what the patient wants from you what you may think best for the patient may not be the best thing for the patient and doing a very good coronaries and then hurting the patient's kidney making him a fully dialysis dependent is not going to help anyone so in that case if i suspected the tool of using ivas will be very helpful but when i'm using uh, Uh, i see a very calcium rich lesion on the fluoroscopy in that case oct will be the best tool that should be used to get the best out of it all these things the clinical context in where to use the which tool that should be our motto and all these lectures will surely help you to prepare for uh, to become a better cardiologist much better than us and thank you again uh, our renown faculties and thank you dr ajit ben thank you thank you sir thank you everyone for having me over it is it's been a privilege and uh, i am i'm really honored to be in the midst of you all, all of you thank, thank you thank you sir good bye sir bye thank you thank you thank you dr thank you thank you hadi roman thank you bye bye thank you i thank you i see you on friday our ajit see uh, you in sing live <laughs> Friday was definitely, definitely. On Friday at 7 p.m., we integrate our uh, research center in the Pantopath. Okay. So I think we we'll, we'll send a link and join okay. the program. Hossein. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sajid. Hossein, our our this is where? Why? Our our hospital is where? Where is it? 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 Where is it?
আমি ইয়ারে দিয়ে দিব আপনি লিংকটা দিয়ে দিব হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা ওকে গুড বাই ওকে থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ওকে থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ স্যার থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ স্টেপ বাই থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ কেমন আরে ভাই আমাদের যে এটা আছে না ইউটিউবে যে ব্যানারটা আছে আপনি দিয়ে দিব আমি দেখতে হ্যালো হেল্প হ্যালো হেল্প হ্যালো হেল্প ওকে আমি তো আমাদের তো হাসপাতাল থেকে মানে বাইরে বুঝে যাই না আরকি বুঝছো না করোনা হয়ে গেলে হাসপাতালের ইনকাম কমে যাবে